Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Truly, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. Amen. I thank God. Amen. For amen this day. And amen. All of those in attendance, thank God for those of you who are watching uh, the telecast over the internet. And we pray that it's a blessing to you. Amen. As we make ready to begin our pastoral teaching, amen, we certainly want to start the day with prayer and thanksgiving unto the Lord. Father, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we love you. We appreciate you, Lord God. We give you praise and we give you thanks for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing and all that you will do. In the life of your people. We thank you for waking us up again. Lord God on today. Yet closed in our right mind. Yet having the usage. And the activities of our limb. With a mind. Uh, Lord God to come. Into your house. Uh, to enter into your gates. With thanksgiving. And into your course with praise. Uh, and to be thankful. Unto you for all that you've done for us. Bless those who are on their way. Bring them safely, quickly, without incident, accident, hurt, harm, or danger. And bless this day, Lord God, so that everything that we do and say, Lord God, will glorify you in every way. Bless the teaching of your word. Let us hear. Let us receive with gladness. And then act upon your word as we continue to give uh, you the praise uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Amen again. Now this is our pastoral teaching. And we are teaching out of the book of First Corinthians. The book of First Corinthians. And we always review what we covered last week and other in order to keep our minds fresh as we continue to press forward in our teaching. And so we find last week, uh, we finally ended uh, chapter 7 where we started at verse 37. So we managed to finish chapter 7 and we went into chapter 8. Again, chapter 7 is dealing with questions about marriage. And we find that Paul is not only answering questions, but he's also giving advice because of the present distress that was going on at that time. And so picking up with verse 37, where we started last week, we see that he reminded us or letting us know that if the father finds it unnecessary to change his plans, uh, it being unnecessary to be thought his virgin daughter because of her being inclined not to marry and wanting to consecrate uh, her body and spirit, as we saw in verse 34, then let him keep his daughter from marriage if this is what she wants to do. If he's not being forced to do so, then keep his daughter from marriage. And we also see in verse 38, which explains verses 36 and 37, and it proved that it is a father who gives or does not give his virgin daughter in marriage. And then we looked at advice that he gave to Christian widows. Okay, verse 39 basically teaches the fact that this appears to be another question that was asked by the church concerning a widow whose husband was dead. And so Paul gave the Christian law on this and he laid down a restriction that she marry only a Christian man and not a heathen. And in verse 40, we find that he gives the advice 
that she should or that she would be happier if she remained single in view of the present condition in the world for Christians. So Paul by no means again contended for celibacy, but he gave sound advice for the present distress that they were facing. And so that ended chapter 7, and then we moved into chapter 8 under a different subject. And that is set free, but how free? We talked about Christian liberty as well as the effect of knowledge and love. And so we see uh, after verse 1, idolatry apparently was the next question that the Corinthians asked advice about from Paul. Okay? So the idea here is that we who are converted to Christianity have sufficient knowledge or should concerning idols and idol worship and certainly the Jews. And we also know that we are not bound presently by Jewish rites and ceremonies, but some may carry their knowledge and liberty too far, okay, and do that which is not best for the cause of Christ because knowledge can tear down but we know that love builds up and so what we do know and have learned that the Corinthians they were puffed up by their knowledge and their liberty in Christ and by doing so they condemned others and it made them bold, rash, and careless regarding the consciousness of others who were not so enlightened. And again, love what? Builds up. It has no quality to puff up or tear down else does knowledge. It can only be constructive since it is of God. And he who loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. love. And we saw in verse 2, the person who acts in a rash, proud way knows nothing else he ought to know. Mm -hmm. He just has the big head. So if he torments, if he torments his brother's weak and tender conscience with his food and conduct, then he does not love God or his brother as uh, he should. Okay? In verse 3 and 4, uh, 5, 6, uh, we talked about uh, two schools of thoughts uh, that were involved. We talked about the Corinthians, they held to the law of the Jewish law, teaching that it was unlawful to receive any benefit from even worship or from anything that had been offered to an idol. And that it was unlawful to buy or sell an idol or meats offered to idols. And then there were the traditionalists. They maintained that they could use such meat provided that, that the sign of the idol was not stamped on it. And we talked about the meat and how they could be stamped to identify one way or uh, the other. So they're not only images according to verse 5, but the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, the ocean, the rivers, the trees, and all other things in creation were actually used as gods by the heathens, by the heathens. And then, of course, we went to the fact that ignorance creates bondage and lack of Christian liberty. And we saw that in Romans 14, verses 1 to 2, 23. And I ask you to read uh, for your uh, homework and study. Uh, but verse 7, we find that some Jews held to certain rights of the law and some Gentiles held to certain heathen rights when they accepted Christ. 
naturally because they had not learned what it is that they should and should not do. So all these differences had to be dealt with and true knowledge gained before perfect harmony between converts could be maintained. So here's the sound advice in this eighth chapter that Paul gives and in others. And we reviewed, we reviewed and talked about the fact that the letters that were written to the Gentile concerning what it is that they should do, and it was also verbally given to them as well. And we learned this in Acts chapter 15. And then we talked about the conscious. What is the conscious? Well, it's conviction of being conscious of a custom. And some had done this all their lives and still regarded sacrifices to idols as real acts of worship, not having true knowledge that idols were nothing. Idols are absolutely nothing. And for such to take part in eating meat offered to an idol was to defile the conscience. And so that's one thing we don't want to do. We don't want to ruin the conscience of the newly believer. Okay? And then, of course, the fact Paul shifted and looked at the wrong use of Christian liberty and its results. Because sometimes we can wrongly use our liberty that we have, and there's always consequences. So in verse 9, we basically learn that we should take heed uh, that we do not attend such feasts to idols, even though convinced that an idol is nothing. Why? Because this liberty may cause another to stumble who still believe that idols are something very real. That people who believe that idols are something that is very real. So he does not have your knowledge, so he will commit sin if he follow your example. Because you have now destroyed his conscience, is condemning him. Now he's doing something that he believe or know that he should not be doing. And this is what Paul is teaching against. Okay, in verse 10, again, uh, to build up when we embolden uh, the weak means to build up or encourage us in verse 1, such an example will build up the weak brother to follow the practice of the strong. Okay, whereas the act of liberty will cause his edifice to come tumbling down and he will perish. So then verse 11 and 12 basically tell us by causing a brother to be lost, you then sin against who? You sin against Christ and you defeat the purpose of his sacrificial death. And that's where we ended in verse 12 and we will pick up this morning with verse 13. Unless there are any questions or comments before we press forward. Again, we are in chapter 8. Yeah, I have something that's not, <coughs> direct, yeah. it's not directly related to this, but it's related to it. Mm -hmm. um, discussing how certain states now are requiring Christian doctrine to be taught in public schools. Requiring? Right. Okay. That, you know, as a Christian, of course, you want the word to get to everybody. Right. But at the same time, my position was, according to the Bible, that's not the place for it. Because just as Paul doesn't want things to be stumbling blocks for new Christians, and with the times that you're in, it was that doctrine, it's just not the appointed place for that. Now, to have your church and be on Facebook to go hand out tracts, and the per people can either accept the tracts or throw them away. You know, it's like our thing is, 
to get out with the word and people can accept it or not accept it. Mm -hmm. And Christ says, if they don't want to accept it, just shake off your shoes and get to stepping. Mm -hmm. But to force kids to actually have to take it as part of their school curriculum, even if their parents are of a different faith and know about Christianity, but have rejected it, is it our place then to, to do that? So that was the argument that we had. And mine was, you know, based upon what I've studied and have learned from Corinthians and how to approach people, and from Romans and some of the other books, it just doesn't seem like that's a good way to do it because Christ even taught to humble yourself to the person's level. Mm -hmm. And if you're humbled to that person's level, it means that you should be respecting where they're at and their point of view. Now, what I'm hearing you say is that we shouldn't teach Christianity in school? In public school. Public because school. Because if, if, you know, if you want your child to do it, well, go to a, go to a church where, at, where they have Sunday school. Okay. Go to a private school. Mm -hmm. Anybody got any comments on that? I do. Yes, sir. Well, I, what I heard uh, yesterday morning when I turned on news is that they are going to uh, require yes, the kids to study from this particular Bible, and it's the Trump Bible. That's what they putting in there. And their prayers, they're going to let them require them to have prayer in school and study from that curricular, and they have to, in their prayer, pray for Donald Trump. Now, nah, that's what I heard. Well, and my, my entire point I on it was if it's a public school open for everybody to only teach Christianity but ban the teaching of any other religion in there, that's not giving people freedom of choice, which Christ has given us freedom of choice to accept him or reject him. I choose to accept him. Mm -hmm. But So if Christ, who's the head of the church, is open to, you can accept or reject, it seems like it's almost like going back to the Crusades where you're trying to force Christianity on somebody and if they don't accept it, you kill them. Because mm -hmm. that's what the whole Crusades were about. Right. Okay, well we're not doing that. I think, Brother Ross, if you have something you want to say? No, I'm, I was just listening to uh, what Mark was saying about uh, an, an, an elder about this, uh, this Trump Bible. I see. Yeah. When, when I, um, I, I went to a Catholic school for only three years, but the curriculum was you had to study, the, you know, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't their religion, it was just all, you know, just yeah. one, one God, one religion. And, uh, you know, the Catholics, they do things a little bit different, but mm -hmm. everything touched on the same, same base. But we had to take this class, you know, the past, uh, which I, I, really, I didn't mind because it, it uh, furthered our walk, you know, with Christ a little bit more. And then, uh, but with this situation that's going on, I don't agree with it at all as far as having a, a Trump Bible. Okay. Uh, besides that, yeah. besides that, the teaching, if we say the Bible is going to be taught, it's right. going to be taught as to what it is, how it came about, what it means, or what have you, or are they actually going to be teaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified from the Bible? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't think that's the case. I think. Um, um, they're going to be teaching religious studies. And if they do that, then they should teach a broad subject of religious study if you're going to broaden the mind right. of the student. Right, but it's only one religion right. that's taught. The yeah. other religions are not allowed to be taught. That's where I have the problem, because you're not giving uh, the freedom of choice to a student, and especially if the family is of a different faith, mm -hmm. you're just asking for trouble within that household, and now the parents themselves, you know, the the worst thing you can do to somebody is say, you must do this, because that makes it forbidden, and you're going to do everything you can to not do that. Yeah. Now, didn't the, Go ahead. Didn't the Bible say that if you add or take away that's that's word, that your name will be taken out of the Lamb 
book of life. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, my understanding is, now I don't want to keep saying that thing, because no, I don't no, want to use sound it political uh, in mm -hmm. here, okay? But my understanding is that there has been some things added to this Bible, taken out, and his name being put in there mm -hmm. on certain aspects. So, then another point is, in that, in that class you might have different, and Mark hit on it a little bit, of families that have raised their kids up in different religions, and different mm -hmm. other religions, but well, that's going to create a problem. Why are you going to force, you know, the kids to, and, you know, back from century, when, when, you know, it was a big old thing when prayer was taken out of the school, mm -hmm. and, and all that kind of stuff. But now all of a sudden, they want to roll back and bring things up, but they want to put demands on it, you know, you know, that, you know, you have to study this, you have to pray this particular prayer or whatever, and it has to be studied from this particular Bible that has been tampered with. Yeah, well, Bibles have been tampered with by other uh, cults and sects as well. So that's not going to be anything new in that regard at all. You see, now we can get God and the Bible back in the church. Yeah. Praise God. Okay? Uh, I don't suspect any teacher is going to be actually preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified today in the school. You see, but there's always need to be that broad spectrum. If you're going to teach anything, it could be an elective subject. Who knows? You see, and I see your hand, Minister Moore. So, uh, God's will will play out in all of this. So nothing for us to get twisted about. You see, praise God. God's word is God's word, and it will always be God's word, and the devil is always going to be trying to put a slant to it, remove stuff, and add stuff to it. It's up to us who know God to teach our children what is and what isn't. Yes? You know, I was listening at the commentary when they first brought it. So on a higher educational level, religion is taught with, it's a, as a class. Mm -hmm. It's that it don't specify uh, this one or that one. Mm -hmm. So you get an introduction to all of them. Mm -hmm. And so like you just said, yeah, so they're not promoting um, Pentecostalism, uh, Pentecostals or right. apostolic. They're promoting, uh, talking about religion as a whole. And then some kids are going to say, go back and say to their mom, well, I believe in this. Like one of my grandchildren, he was telling me the one that, that he was close was closely aligned to his beliefs. And I said, How did you how did you come to that? And it was from his class that he had had taken in school. And I didn't even know that they were teaching that uh, on that level. And I was like surprised. I said, Of course I don't agree with it. And he told me how he felt about what we agree with and how the consistency that we have was really admirable. But this is what reached and touched him and aligned with him. And I was just like really surprised. I was like, wow, this is this is on a college level. So they're bringing it down to, a, you know, the, the, I don't know if it's going to be elementary or high school. So parents' job is going to be to really do their job. Just as with Kim, when she graduated high school and she had started her community work, she was bringing back a lot of names that were not of the faith that we talked about. So you said to her, he said, you, at that age, because she was still in the house, she said, you can't change your religion. So I started following her. So I could say, you know what? This doesn't agree with them, but they weren't teaching it. It was just who they, their last names were. I just wanted to share that. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist have been permeating our society for the long. Because when I was going to school, you was going to school, you know, every morning before we entered that building, we was outside, pledge of religion, we had prayer, and there was no issue talking about God and the Bible, and what was right and what's wrong. Times have changed. Yep. Because we're moving into the end time. So if we know this and aware of this, then it makes us responsible, more responsible, about what we should do particularly concerning our children and those we come in contact with. 
we have to preach and teach the unadulterated word of God. Absolutely. All right, but that was a good, uh, <laughs> good question, good comments, uh, good responses uh, concerning that. You see, and again, we'll see what how it plays out and what happens. So then, uh, again, um, uh, by causing a brother to be lost, we sin against Christ, and we defeat the purpose of his sacrificial death. So Paul's in chapter eight with verse 13 where he says in order to avoid uh, destroying a brother, okay, or causing him to sin, he said, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, in other words, to cast a snare before one so as to destroy him, Paul said, I will eat no flesh while the word standeth, least I make my brother to offend. So if he can't eat the meat that I can eat, because he believed that it was offered unto an idol, then Paul is basically saying, I won't eat it. And remember that Paul is a Jew, and we know what kind of meat that he would eat. But even that kind of meat was offered to idols. And so if it offends his brother and causes him to a stumble, Paul said, I'm not going to eat any meat. And I'd rather not even touch it. If it's going to mess you up, I'd rather do without it. I'll do that just for you. <laughs> so in other words, if you know somebody's a vegetarian and you invite them over, don't serve burgers. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Especially if you know that. You don't want to offend them. They're vegetarian. And all you got on your plate is big steaks and Hulk and everything else, and he ain't gonna eat it. So he's gonna say, Why should I go to your house? I've been up against that. I, I was invited out to dinner, they didn't tell me what they were having, and, and it was pork, it was pork chops. Yeah. And I just sat there for a minute and I said, Oh, I forgot to tell you, I don't eat pork. Yeah. They looked at me like, <laughs> He said, But well, that's all we got. Uh, you eat the vegetables then. Yeah. That's, that's it. You just eat what you can eat. That's what I've done down through the year. I don't like picking at people's food. I don't want to uh, offend anybody. I just get what I can eat and then I'm satisfied. And if I have an opportunity to talk to them proud too, then I can let them know what I eat or don't eat. You see, whether it's good or bad, or how I want to eat it. You see, so I won't waste their food, and that's on the respect. Get from the Romans 14, 21. Romans 14, 21. Look what it said. He said, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thou brother stomach or is offended or is made weak. So if your brother is made weak by any of these actions, then you ought to leave it alone. Refrain from it. Just let it go. And that's what Paul is saying. Before he offend you and tear down your conscience and cause you to sin, he would rather not even eat it while the world stands. <laughs> oh, that's a strong comment. Yes, sir. I can say it's about uh, the need to have a discernment. Say again. It leads into having discernment. You will only want to accept something from a cheerful giver. Yeah. And be a cheerful giver. And be a cheerful giver. It has to be reciprocated. Right, absolutely. Because love builds up. But knowledge will tear people down. Because it makes you puffed up and makes you rash. You see, you make you think you know it all, but Paul says in his writing, you you really don't know nothing. Yeah, you ought to know. Do what he told Agrippa. Yeah. <laughs> he said, do what's learning than the yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Right? And we have already learned that if you want to become wise, Paul said, then first of all, become a fool. So you can be taught to be wise. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How we doing? Good. All right. We're going to move to chapter 9. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being in the teaching this morning, brother. And you who? Robert Jones. Invited by 
No, he was just uh, coming in on. Oh, okay. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We thank God for you. Yeah. All right, let's move into chapter 9. Again, we're studying the book of Corinthians in excruciating detail. So we can understand it as we move along. Now we're in chapter 9. Uh, we're shifting subject. So in this chapter, we're going to find criticism about Paul's answer. Paul is going to answer criticisms about him. Okay? So that's why he starts out in verse 1 by asking this question. Am I not an apostle? And he's writing to the Corinthians. Now keep in mind, Paul founded the Corinthian church. He established that church. He brought the word and established that. He said, am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? He's telling you or giving his qualification for being an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? Okay? So there were some in Corinth, obviously, who questioned Paul's apostleship. They questioned his apostleship. However, there are nine arguments proving Paul's apostleship. Okay? That's why he's asking, am I not an apostle? Okay? Have I not seen Jesus Christ? So let me give you these nine arguments. Okay? Proving Paul's apostleship. First of all, his claim of being an apostle. He claimed to be an apostle. An apostle is a delegate, a messenger, a one who was sent with orders. Again, I would say, he would say what the person who sent him would say if that person was there. So if we are a delegate of a high official and we go in his or her name, then we would say what they would say if they were there to say it. So Paul said, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be saying what he would say if he was here to say it himself. And we have already saw in Corinthians where Paul made distinctive lines where it was the Lord commanding or he himself were giving advice. Okay? So he didn't take anything for granted. So the first claim is that he is an, an apostle, his own claim. Secondly, his claim to freedom to all secular and religious bondage, enabling him to be completely devoted to the apostleship. He said, am I not free? This is basically what he's saying. The third claim is, is his claim of what? Seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus. That's the third. He said, hey, I saw him. And we saw him, he saw him when? When did he see him? When he went to um, Syria. He on his road to, to, to Damascus. To Damascus. To Damascus. I thought it was coming. Yeah, Syria. <laughs> That's it. And the Lord brought him to his feet. Brought him off. Took him off this mountain. Amen. All right, that's the third claim. The fourth claim is that the very existence of the Corinthian church and their conversion from heathenism also prove his apostleship. And we'll see that later as we continue to study the book. Also, number five, his consecration to abnormal human living so as to preach the gospel. That one when we get through all that, are we? I was marking them in my. Oh, I'm just reading them out to you. Oh, wow. In advance. Oh, okay. That was number five. This consecration to abnormal human living so as to preach. So if you know Paul's life story, then you also know this. Number six, his unselfish uh, uh, devotion to the apostleship without pay. We're going to see that coming up. His divine obligation to fulfill his call 
to the apostleship. That's number seven. We'll see all of this. Number eight is his devoted service. His devoted service to not some men, but to all men to win them to what? Christ. The gospel. Yeah, that's right. The, the gospel to Christ. And number nine, his qualification for the apostleship and the Christian race. <laughs> We're going to see all of this as we study, okay? So Paul is going to be answering these criticisms concerning him. Now watch verse 2. Now be good with that. We got that? And you can always review the video uh, online uh, to refresh uh, your study on this. Verse 2 he said, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to who? You. To you. You being the Corinthian church. That's who he's writing to, right? He said, yet doubtless I am an apostle to you. For the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. That's my seal. Because I'm establishing. I preach the gospel to you. That's my seal right there. We have already talked about that, right? Yep. Okay? So, what is a seal? It was a figure that was cut in stone and set in a ring by which letters of authority were stamped. Okay, so Greeks excelled in this kind of engraving. Paul used this figure to express the fact that their conversion was proof of his apostolic authority. Seal. <laughs> yet, I, uh, yet Dallas, I am to you for the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. So he speaks where they can understand what he's saying for that people that day and time. So verse 3 he said, my answer to them that do examine me is this. In other words, here's my answer to those who are criticizing me. <laughs> I tell you, hey, criticism everywhere you look. Paul says here, verse 4, Have we not power to eat and drink? Now the we is referring to the apostles. Okay? Keep that in mind. Have we not power to eat and drink? So have we not power to eat and drink at the expense of who? The, at the expense the, the, of the new Christian who the could Christian stumble. or the church. The church. Paul said, have we not power to eat and drink at the expense of the church that we have founded? Paul said, we have that power to be taken care of by the church. If others, he's telling me, if others receive your support, are we not worthy also of your support? Isn't that something? We have not used this right of others have. Paul said we haven't used this right of others have. When you use the, uh, the, the, the plural in this because he's talking about himself and other apostles. Okay? Verse 5 said, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, who is Peter. In other words, lead about a Christian sister, as a wife, as other apostles, and as brethren of the Lord. So he's talking about other apostles who are married who follows them in their ministry, okay? So, let me break down the ladies turn. Have we not the same right, Paul is saying, to be married as Peter is, okay? The Lord's brethren and the other apostles. We have consecrated to live with self-restraint for your sake, and yet, we are being criticized by you. Yeah. Lord, have mercy Jesus. <laughs> so this is decisive proof 
As I mentioned last week, against celibacy of the clergy and the Pope Paul doctrine of having holy women minister to the needs of celibate ministers. Okay? Had the apostle permitted young women or wives of others to accompany them as personal servants instead of their own wives, it would have produced continuous what? Trouble. Trouble, scandal. Trouble. Scandal. scandal. Scandal and trouble. Yeah. Absolutely. You see, this is basically what he was saying there in verse 5. So we understand that, right? Again, they, they, they're living a concentrated life, okay? Abnormal human condition so as to preach and teach the gospel, as well as their unselfish devotion to the apostleship without pay. So we're getting to that, even though he said that it was lawful for them to be taken care of by the church. That's their responsibility. So he said in verse 6, On I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? So what he's saying, are we the only apostles that have no right to be supported by the church? He said, what's up with that? You supporting everybody else? Don't we have the right to be supported by the church as well? So we see four things that are clear here. One, Barnabas adopted Paul's method of supporting himself. Because what Barnabas did, we find what he did in uh, Acts chapter 4, and you can write this, verse 36 and 37, Barnabas, if you remember, he sold his land and he gave the money to the apostles. He sold his land. And that's where you'll find it in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. Matter of fact, let's go there so you know I'm telling you the truth. In case you haven't read Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. And Jose, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, he is a Levite. We know Levites were taken care of by the church. the church because that's a Levitical priesthood and of the country of Cyrus. Verse 37, having land, what did he do? Sold. He sold it. And he brought the money and put it where? At the apostles. <laughs> Is it in the book? It's in the book. Okay, that's that's, that, that, that's point number one that is clear here. Secondly, apostles in general were supported by the church and not by secular labor. May I say here that I should be supported by the church? <laughs> I founded it by the help of the Holy Ghost. Should I have to be out there working for a living? Or should I be supported by the church? Well, somebody said, Pastor, you better keep a job. <laughs> you would be in a hurt locker. <laughs> but point number three, Paul and Barnabas had a trade by which they could support themselves. And I admire any preacher pastor today who can. They love to be in a hurt locker. They shouldn't be. And the fourth point that is made clear they chose to support themselves in certain places so as not to hinder the founding of a church. We ain't going to hinder establishing churches and growing churches. We would rather work ourselves. And we know that Paul's trade was what? Ten maker. Ten maker. He was a ten maker by trade. And that's why he asked the question in verse 6, Or I own in bundles, have not we power to forbear working? Why should we have to work? You should be taking care of us. Praise God. So, in verse 7 he said, 
who goeth a warfare any time at his own expense or charges. Paul is asking a question here. Who go to war at any time at his own expense? Well, when I joined the, uh, the Marine Corps, I didn't go at my own expense. They fed me, clothed me, slept me, gave me ammunition, gave me weapons, everything that I needed. I got to pay for it. <laughs> But if I had to pay for all that, I probably wouldn't have gone. So he's asking that question because it makes sense, right? He said, who planted a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? He's asking rational, reasonable question. I mean, you're going to plant a vineyard and you ain't going to eat none of your vineyard? Oh, yes, I am. Oh, that Ms. Moore said she will. Or <laughs> uh, who feedeth a flock? <laughs> who feedeth a flock? and eat it not of the milk of the flock. Mm -hmm. How you gonna feed chickens and don't eat the egg? <laughs> How you gonna feed a cow and you don't get the milk? Uh, a plant your garden and not eat the vegetables. Yeah. So how are you gonna plant a church? <laughs> Watch yourself. <laughs> That's what he's saying to me. Yeah. How you gonna do it? How you gonna plant a church? Nurture, preach, and teach, and labor. And not reap what you have sown. Hmm? I would say uh, we are worthy of double honor. And especially those who keep a line of extinction. Especially those who labor in the word and the doctrine. <laughs> My God, how we doing? Okay. So again, charges here, so you know what charges mean. Uh, it was a soldier's ration. Okay? So the answer to all these questions of verses 7 and verse 8 are self-evidence. Self-evidence that the apostles, the pastors, should be taken care of by the church. Okay, verse 8 then says, Say I these things else a man, that's a question, or say it not the law the same also. In other words, am I just talking to you out of what I feel, out of my opinion, or is it already written somewhere else, Elder Turner? Yeah, but, 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 but a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, but the pastor, you taking care of a day, uh, it don't, right when you flying around in no jet and, and uh, you know and all this kind of stuff. Oh, those who are living extravagantly. Living up in the mansion and you know got the church paying for it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then you got an old mother sitting in the church barely making it you know but you flying around in the jet and saying you know uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah I can understand <laughs> that, that that perspective as well. Yeah. I um some people manage their money very well, mm -hmm. and they learn how to invest and reap off of their investments. Right. And they do quite well. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's unfair to say <clears throat> what the pastor can't have, especially if they manage their money correctly. Right. And yep. some people, you know, they don't manage their money correctly. Right. I don't believe that. I don't believe the pastor should be poor. <clears throat> I don't believe the members in the church. Uh, should be suffering either. Not at all. You see, we have to be good stewards of what God gives us. And there are pastors out there, their money is not even coming from the church. It's because of their own investment yeah. Yeah. and what they do. So you can't fault them for that. Not if you do, you are, finding a, you are finding an excuse yeah. not to give them their just due. And God going to hold you responsible. So I'm not discounting uh, what you said. No, not at all, because we got those out there, too. Right, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I've seen some of them, how they give, and they invest, and they sow, and then God does what he says he's going to do. Oh, yeah. Other mm -hmm. people will come and give them a jet, a yes. different things like that, but I don't think, you know, we have a, this church full of people on social services, and we know that they're barely making it. Mm -hmm. We have money, and we don't help. We don't do that anyway. We're givers, but um, it would be good if the people really understood this. Because when you give to the man and woman of God, you're gonna be blessed. You're going to be blessed. 
Absolutely. So we're just understanding what the text says. And if we understand what the text says, then we should do what the text says. And we don't want to hinder our own blessing. Praise the Lord. So then Paul said again in verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or says not the law the same also. Look what he said. He said, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mocks, the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn. Doeth God take care for oxen? For it is written. Okay, when you got to verse 9 this week in your study, you are able now to tell me where it's written. Where is it written? Tell on yourself. You should at least made it to verse 9. For it is written. Where well, it's quoted from Deuteronomy 25 and 4. Let's look at it. Deuteronomy 25 and 4. Paul letting them know it. They knew the Torah or the book of the law. It says right there. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox with threaded out the corn. Because if you do that, if he's working and you don't feed him, eventually he's going to do what? Die ass out. He's going to die. He's going to drop dead. Because you're not feeding him. You're not doing anything for him. Also, look at 1 Timothy 5.18. 1 Timothy 5.18. Chapter 5, verses 18. Somebody said it's good teaching. What was that? Deuteronomy 25 and 4. Deuteronomy 25 and 4, what we just read. Now we're looking at 1 Timothy 5 and 18. For the scripture saith, again, pointing us to what the the old book has said, the Old Testament, that if we ever read it, we should stop and find out where. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn. And the laborer is what? Worthy of, Worthy of his reward. <coughs> my God, my God. That's a shouting moment right there. How we doing? Good. Again, he's asking and answering question. Verse 10 says, Or... Saith he, saith he it altogether, simply for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt. <laughs> for our sake, no doubt it was written. Talking about him in the particles. No, it was written for our sake. Huh? That this is written. Why? That he that ploweth should plow in hope. I mean, I come here pastoring in hope. <laughs> and he that thrashes or thread out the corn in hope should be partakers of that hope. Rob the man and woman of God and you rob God. You rob yourself. That's what you do. Now, man, that's why so, you know, folks get in the situation that they're in. I never want to find myself robbing, and I did it, even those who were above me, whom those whom I was following. I gave my best. So, what do you say in verse 10? That everyone should be a partaker of his own labors. Okay? So he said in verse 11. Again, he said, if we, we being who? Him and Barnabas. Him and Barnabas, even other apostles, right? If we have sown unto you spiritual things, what is your responsibility? Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? I, I mean, is, is, is that man Barnabas? That we should reap your old kind of thing? Now see, when I was growing up, that we had itinerary preachers, a pastor. You know, if people had church on first Sunday, first and third, then there was second and fourth, and the pastor went around. And the pastor who were pastor with the congregation during that time, because of the time that we were living in, they would bring them boxes of canned goods, food, fruit, vegetable, whatever they were farming. They brought it to him and made sure that they were taken care of. So we're not farmers. 
So we ain't bringing boxes of goodies up. We got some problems. But we got, we got, we got money in our pocket, don't we? And if maybe we can bring that. That way we can eat what we want to eat. <laughs> All right, how we doing? All right, well, we'll stop here at 8, verse 11. I wrote down 1 Timothy 5, 17. We looked at 5, 18. Let's look at 1 Timothy 5, 17. Look that down for a reason. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Yeah, yeah, there we go. He said, let the elders that rule well be counted what? Worthy. Worthy. Of dumb honor. So if you decide to give him five, the Bible says you ought to give him ten. Mm -hmm. He was a double honor. Now, especially, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Especially. If you won't give anybody a double honor, that's the person who ought to get it. How we doing? Question, comments are hard burn. You got three minutes. Back in the Two. Mm -hmm. um, my mother had five kids. And so she had very low income, but she was a fisherwoman. So she was a prolific fisher. So what she would do when she would go fish, she would set aside her tithe of the fish and she would clean it. Mm -hmm. And she would give the pastor's family. Mm -hmm part of that fish as her tithe because she didn't have a large income. Mm. And then she would keep the rest for us. And I just, <clears throat> this really blessed me, this is the last thing. A few years back, when we was in the old building, we had more, a few more members than we have now. And there was somebody that used to bless us every month with goods. I couldn't believe it. We had so many goods coming from her every month, we wanted her to stop. But we never said anything. And she wasn't even a member. She just came with her family member. And I thought, I said, Lord, that is just so remarkable. But every month she came and she gave. Mm -hmm. She gave, I mean, things that we could use. But it came, became to be in an abundance. And I thought that was just really remarkable. Because yeah. God is true to his word. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So we thank God for his teaching this morning. Also, we thank God for Brother Robert Jones coming in on his own. Okay, uh, he's a first-time guest. He's new to the area. All right. He would like to know more about the church. Yes. Okay, he's single. He's in his 20s. And uh, he doesn't have a church home, so he's a new resident. And again, he's a first-time visitor, so he would certainly like to welcome you, uh, Brother Jones, to the Voices of Victory Christian Ministry, Amen. where we teach and believe that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. I'm the pastor, uh, Pastor Willie Moore, my wife, First Lady Joyce Moore. That's the elder turn over there, one of our social ministers, Brother uh, Russell behind you, and Brother Mark in the uh, sound booth, yes, and uh, others who will come and you'll get to meet and see them as well. So know that you're welcome. Amen. And I tell you, like my spiritual father used to tell me, the first time you come, you're a visitor. Next time you come, you're just coming home. <laughs> so you're welcome. With that then, let us stand. And right after we dismiss here, we take 30 minutes fellowship, a nutrition break in the fellowship center before we start service at 11 o'clock. All right, so you're more than welcome to stay with us and be with us uh, throughout uh, the services. Father, Lord God, we love you. We appreciate you. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you thanks again for the teaching of your word. Open up our hearts, minds, and our understanding, Lord God, that we will receive it, sear it to our consciousness, so that we may know your ways. So everything that we say and do will glorify you in every way. Bless the food that has been prepared for us for the nourishing and strengthening of our bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.